Thank you all for being here. My name is Brittany Hernandez. I am your host for this Lightning Talk series in partnership with Documate. I am a lawyer and the founder of Kameam Law and Kameam Kamai LLC, both of which focus on how innovations in tech can be used to solve human problems, both within the law and beyond. I'm also a freelance pro documenter with Gig Law, a document advisor and tutor, a co-creator and senior instructor of the brand new documenter certification course, and I was recently invited to represent Document around the world as our global ambassador to law schools. Today, lawyer and legal tech consultant Anja Sarah Lahady will share her expertise on the topic, Agile Practices in Legal Tech, Project Management Tips from Tech Teams for Successful Product Development. Feel free to post your questions in the chat as you think of them, and Anja will pick them up once she concludes. After questions, I'll do a quick wrap up, after which you're free to stay on the call for an optional five minutes of speed networking, where I'll invite four people to introduce themselves for one minute each. I'd now like to introduce today's speaker. Anja is a corporate and commercial lawyer based in Canada, as well as a legal tech consultant providing document automation services for Documates clients. She started practicing law in an innovation-oriented firm in Montreal, where she integrated Document into the firm's processes a little more than two years ago. She has now shifted her practice towards legal tech consultation and focuses on helping other law firms and legal professionals with the automation of their processes. Anja also uses her prior to law work experience in a startup where she collaborated closely with tech developers and agile coaches and now applies this experience in the management of her clients legal tech project projects. Thank you so much for being with us today Anja the floor is now yours. Thank you for that introduction. So I am not able to share my screen. One second, Anja. Okay, go ahead and try. Perfect. So today I'm gonna talk about agile practices in legal tech, and I'm gonna start this with a disclaimer um, because I am in no way an agile coach. Um, it's just, I have learned uh, all of these tips working from a tech startup, as Brittany said. Um, and basically, I was asked uh, to develop back then an internal portal uh, to automate payroll. And my job back then was doing payroll. So I had absolutely no experience in product development, but I was uh, coached by agile coaches and working with developers along the way to develop that project. And surprisingly, all of that experience came in handy when I became a lawyer and had to actually implement legal tech projects in my legal practice for my law firm. So uh, also, just to say, when I'm referring to product development in this presentation, I am in no way referring to uh, creating a whole legal tech software. It can be just creating an app or um, a workflow in Documate with a no-code or low-code platform. Um, so you want to create a product, uh, a self-serve self -serve product or an internal product for your legal team, let's say. That's what we're going to designate with product development here. So let's start with why being agile matters. And just so that everyone here is on the same page about what being agile is, it's a methodology for project management. Um, so basically it's a way to approach the management of a project, mostly applied to product development. And why being agile matters, it's basically because some legal tech projects fail. And actually in a survey in the artificial lawyer, it was said that 77% of um, legal tech implementation actually failed. And while all of the, we will not focus on all of these reasons, but I will focus on some of them being resistance to change implementation issues or people not, the users not seeing significant uh, return on investment or return on the time invested. And all of the spe these specific issues can be prevented and addressed with an agile approach um, in product development. And then we will look at who actually needs to be agile. So I will oppose traditional big organization against startup for this. So traditional big organization used to tend to have more resources, a larger talent pool. So they have this ability to test out multiple ideas at once and figure out which one works best for them. So they can afford failure um, in a certain way because they can afford that some of their ideas will fail. They also have a better knowledge or more data on their customer or on their industry, which startups do not have. So startups have less resources. They tend to have a talent pool, which is very technical, very focused, uh, very technical experts. 
so they have less knowledge of the customers or of the industry in general and they cannot try multiple ideas at once so they need to develop an approach being the agile approach that makes it so that they cannot because they cannot afford failure and that makes it easy for them to be able to turn around if something does not work the way it was planned to work so while in this dichotomy i ask who needs to be agile it's more a question of when do we need to be agile because it doesn't mean that large organizations do not have to be agile in some specific projects. Big law firms can uh, may need to be agile when developing a legal tech project because there is a lot of unknown data or unverified assumptions about the customer. We don't know if the actual end user, the, the legal customer, the traditional legal customer actually wants to use a product to automate their NDA, let's say. Um, so you want to have this approach and sometimes you also have limited budget or limited time, um, limited resources, human resources allocated to legal tech. So you need to minimize the re risk um, associated with developing a legal tech project and you want to make failure or turnaround cheap. So basically that's when an agile approach comes in handy, you need to have a low risk approach. So you start small, it's a low cost process and you build along the way. So you experiment along the way and you learn as you go. So you build your project step-by-step step and iterate. Let's check more in detail what agility means. So what does it mean to be agile in legal tech? And we're gonna look at the example of a legal tech project. So let's say I wanna develop an internal portal for my corporate legal team. And I want to have this portal so that they, they can create entities, they can update entities. I wanna link it to my CRM. I wanna link it to my e-signature process. I wanna link it to a digital um, book management um, software as well. So I have this whole project with uh, all of these requirements. And let's say uh, I use the traditional approach. So using the traditional approach, I would look at this project, I would um, define all of the requirements, I would design my portal, I would test it, and I would have one final delivery, let's say in a year away from now to my customer, which is the internal client um, to my internal team. So I would say in a year away from now, all the lawyers and paralegals are now expected to use this uh, portal that we've been developing for one year um, and that we have defined one year ago. So there are chances that this is not going to work because this is not going to actually this is not actually going to fit what the customer needs, and that's why we need to go uh, towards an agile approach. And agile is kind of a mix between being incremental and being iterative, so it's kind of a continuum. So I will first of all cover what it means to be incremental. And if I would approach this same project with an incremental approach, I would have a stage delivery. So I would start out, I don't have some of the data or some of my requirements are not defined, I don't know them. I would design code, test, and then uh, build increments. So I would deliver maybe feature by feature. I would have a first delivery of that portal with feature to create or update uh, corporations. And then I would have a, another delivery with other features that um, allows the lawyers to link it to the CRM or to the e-signature process. And that I would have my final delivery, which is the last increment with all of the features included. So that would be a stage delivery. Now uh, let's look at an iterative delivery which is a bit different, it would be more of a spiral approach. So just for this analogy for me, to make it simple, let's say I'm writing a book and I'm writing a book with an incremental approach. I would write that book and I would deliver chapter one and two to my editor and then chapter three and four to my editor and then chapter five and six and then my bio to my editor. Um, if I would use an iterative approach, if I, would, if I were to write that book, I would write a first rough draft of that book. So I would write chapter one to six, and then I would go back to chapter one and revisit the whole chapter one to six and correct and refine along the way. So it's more of a spiral approach. And now let's go back to our portal. So that would mean that we would deliver that portal to our team. Um, then we would test it, we refine it along the way. So we would test all of the, we would deliver a portal with all of the features that has been that have been discussed but then we would refine along the way all of the features that are in that portal so that is the iterative approach being agile is a mix of both of them so we want to make the iter incremental and iterative to have a stage delivery but to also have iterations so you would deliver increments of that portal with some features but you also use the feedback and data that you collect from the customers to iterate and refine it as you go and then 
you would deliver another increment based on those iterations. And that would be the, the never ending loop or the never ending stage of being agile. So that would be the way you would deliver that final portal to your internal clients. So to your lawyers and paralegals, and that would be a way to make sure that they the final product, the, the final delivery actually fits um, what the customer needs because you had so much increments and iterations along the way. Now let's look at the major agile core values and take a look at them with how I apply them to legal tech. So first of all, agile put individuals and interactions over processes and tools. And that means that tech itself does not solve everything. So you cannot just buy your tech and expect it to solve all of the problems. Your team and your people are the best problem solvers. So you need to um, see your team as the people who are going to solve problems along the way and not just the tech. Then we would have working software over comprehensive documentation. That would mean that you need to focus on delivering an actual product to the user, to the end user, in order for them to be able to test it, to collect feedback on it, instead of having that whole comprehensive documentation and having to plan for a whole year before I deliver something that people are going to use. So you need to put a working product in the hands of the end user or of the end customer as soon as possible in order to be able to increment and iterate it as you go to refine that product. Then we would have customer collaboration over contract negotiation. And I find this one very interesting in my legal tech practice, because usually when we're talking about contract negotiation, when we're defining that the whole requirements for that legal tech project, I'm talking with the decision makers. So I'm usually talking with the managing partners of that firm, and we're defining what the product will look like. But the managing partners are not typically the one who are going to be using that product. So it's important to have a customer collaboration. And when we're talking about the customer, we're talking talking about the end user, the actual people that are going to use that product. So it could be the paralegal, it could be the, the lawyers, it could be people that ha are not related to legal, um, but you need to have those people involved and not be scared of amending that initial, um, those initial contract um, requirements and adapt along the way to what the customer actually says and to the actual feedback of that customer. And then finally, responding to change over following a plan. So adapt, being um, flexible and being able to adapt is a core value in being agile. So you do not need to follow the plan at all costs. The quicker you are to respond to change, the quicker you are, the cheaper you make your failure. So you need to be quick to respond to any change along the process. And you need to think of processes as not being static. They, ch they change as they go, and you need to be able to adapt to the, that change. And when you do project management, people tend to be very um, careful or cautious with change because it means changing project scope. It means more cost. But you, in being agile, you need to kind of embrace that whole um, changing mindset along the way because you need to embrace collecting feedback and changing the plan along the way. And now let's look at how uh, to be agile in legal tech in, a, in a, an accelerated process. So I have the before development, during development, and after development. So let's start by planning our um, legal tech project. So the planning stage, even though agile does not uh, put a lot of focus on um, comprehensive, extensive planning, we still need to design what the end product will look like. So we need to identify the pain points. So what is the current process that we have? What are the problems that we have in our current process? Is it that the lawyer A and lawyer B do not do intake uh, in the same way? Is it that uh, lawyers are not using the same templates? Some lawyers are using precedents. Some lawyers are not even using uh, up-to-date templates. So this is the current process. And then you would have to design the ultimate user experience. So you need to map out the final process that you actually want. And one thing that I find very important in this, um, clients usually come to me and tell me, this is my current process, so we, we're going to digitize this. It's very important not to just replicate the current process into a digitized digitalized version of that process. You actually need, need to use um, the tech to add value to that process. So you 
you don't, you are not limited to what the current process is. You you can build new value through tech. So let's say here, um, my ultimate final process would be to have a standardized intake integrated with a C, with a CRM. So I'm actually using the value that tech can uh, give me to um, create a new process, a better process, cheaper, faster uh, than what I used to have. And then you would reverse engineer. So you would figure out the steps that you would need to get to that final outcome and define how do we measure success for that project. So you need to set KPIs, key performance indicators, and uh, set how you measure return on investment for that project. So what does it mean for that portal project to succeed? Uh, does it mean that I will reduce the numbers of people that are involved in my intake process? I would reduce the intake process time by a certain amount of time or eliminate, uh, eliminate possible mistakes in my final documents. So that would mean I would have um, a lower review time. So those would be the metrics. And now that we're done planning, we need to keep in mind that we are we shouldn't be scared to revisit the initial plan. So you need to adapt the long-term goals as you go and not be scared or stick, it, stick to the plan at all costs. Um, so here I have put what roughly my uh, project phases look like when I work with clients. Obviously it's a very simplified version, but it's important to have small deliveries throughout the way, not just the delivery of the final workflow in a month. Uh, you can work with clients to deliver, let's say first the intake and then they would review and then they would comment and then um, deliver the outputs. If you have a lot of output documents, it can be useful to, it can be relevant to actually divide them and have them tested and different blocks. And then it comes, we, we're coming to testing. You need to have a test and learn mindset. So you need to test your assumptions before making expensive or irreversible decisions. So before going ahead and automating those 40 templates, make sure that those are actually the templates that you are going to use at the end of the day, or if there is another streamlined or um, a different way to actually have those uh, templates. And then develop a testing strategy for deliverables. So having an efficient testing strategy is a very useful in legal tech because you cannot just deliver a whole portal in one year away from now and expect people to be able to test it and test all of the features in it. So you need to test by incremental blocks so that testing is not intimidating. And finally, all along the way, you need to have collaboration with the customer, the final user. So you need to involve the people that are actually going to use the product uh, in all of those phases. And I'm going to end with implementation. So once you launch, you need to have training and adoption methods. So you would need to have a communication plan, training and demo content, or integrate all of the the training content into your onboarding process. So people need to actually know how to use your process or your product in order to adopt it. Then you need to make call, uh, to make feedback collection easy. So find ways to encourage people uh, to submit feedback. And it's not sufficient, I think, to just tell uh, all of the lawyers or all of the paralegals of that department to just uh, submit feedback through my email address. You need to make it easy for them to be able to submit feedback just as it's easy for us to submit feedback when we're using a software. There's a streamlined way to do this. So what I usually, usually do is provide my clients with a feedback portal where they can submit feedback on the, the apps that we built. Then you can collect data. So you can build a data dashboard to measure the use of the app. You, you measure how long it takes, how many times is it actually, are those templates actually used? Are those workflows actually used? Um, which bugs are we having? And finally, you need to revisit every six months or every year that product because you need to use that actual feedback that you have collected and that actual data that you have collected to update and improve the product that you have. So you need to keep in mind that it's, um, a repeat loop, it's a never ending loop, ongoing improvement of your product is important and launching is not a finality. So processes are not static and they evolve with time. So you need to make sure that your final product, even though it's not final, but your, your product evolves with the process as well. 
So in summary, being agile means to be an iterationist instead of being a perfectionist. And I find that this image kind of summarizes it well. Um, when I started my legal tech journey, I used to think that being a lawyer and my lawyer mindset was like my greatest asset. But as lawyer, we tend to be perfectionists. We tend to have a very uh, risk averse and detail oriented approach. And we we're kind of go big or go home. So we don't want to launch that portal until it's perfect in one year. So that go big or go home can be can work against you when uh, developing a legal tech product. Um, so I find it better to have an iterationist approach and go stage by stage, learn as you go and iterate along the way. So that's it. And I have put a few resources at the end. If you are interested in knowing more about digital transformation in general or on the job methodology, or I can take questions now. Amazing job, Anja. Thank you. So so much for that, actually. And it's so hard to kind of get everything condensed into 20 minutes, but I think you did a wonderful job here. Um, I think one of the questions that I had, and we'll, we have about um, five minutes for questions, so um, I will call on Scott. Um, if I could just ask one really quick one about adoption, um, internal versus external, and then Scott will go next, um, which is around, you mentioned a little bit about buy-in and adoption um, within the team. So I just wonder if you could go just a tiny bit into sort of external adoption um, from the client's point of view of the end user, for example. So the client who's actually filling out the information, um, maybe they're used to having an interaction with their lawyer in a particular way. So how do you kind of guide your clients where your client is the one that you're automating for, maybe a law firm, but that end user is their client, which is the one who needs whatever service. I think it's kind of important to make the client feel like they're uh, being supported when using a product, because um, first question would be, is it realistic to view law as a product business and I think yes but you you still need to kind of have a feel of that lawyer interaction if you are doing a complex document so I think it's important for the user to be able to for the and client to be able to know when the the document or the scenario that they are going through becomes too complex and that they need to talk to a lawyer so have a um, a way to make the lawyer contact accessible. So either it, would it be having your Calendly accessible at the end? And I think that would pretty much be um, around having a lot of instructions or video demo, demos along the way in the intake to make the client to get a feel of that whole lawyer interaction, but in a digitalized process, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's a, it's just kind of adding in that hybrid sort of um, human element into this technology process. Um, and then Scott, did you have a question that you wanted to pose? You can go ahead and unmute. I might have dropped out. Does anyone else have a question for Anja? I think we had, um, while well, you guys are thinking of your questions, um, Lori put a great comment in that said, what I love about this is the focus on small deliveries. Uh, this will help me assure my clients uh, help me assure that my clients are making progress on their projects. So I think that's a really great point, Lori. Thank you for that. So does anyone else have a question? If not, I'm going to um, go ahead and proceed with the wrap up. Brittany, I have a quick question. I don't have a hand for some reason. Um, uh, thank you so much, Anja. Anja. That was so great. And I think that comment that Lori mentioned also applies so broadly to all types of customers, like whether you're a pro documenter working for a client, whether you're an internal attorney at a firm working for um, an internal client, or whether you're working for an external client who you just want to show progress to. Um, so that was, that was really helpful. I'm curious, Anja, how did you come across agile methodology, because I feel like it's something that us as lawyers, we don't talk about very much. And it's something that I myself, as a former lawyer, didn't really learn about until I, I entered the tech field. So I'm curious how you first became exposed to it. Um, so yeah, basically, I became exposed to it when I was working for a Montreal startup, which was the equivalent of Uber here in Quebec. And uh, back then, I, we had an agile coach as our boss who wanted us to be very involved in like uh, making the company evolve with, with, it, with it. So um, while my job was basically a student job of uh, doing payroll, um, my job then became 
developing that internal app to automate payroll for like 350 employees. So I kind of had to learn along the way and be able to like hop into that whole tech environment and that whole agile tech methodology, which I was not familiar with, but that was the way like the whole company was working on the tech side. So once I hopped in that, that project, I kind of become uh, be baited in all of that, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, that's how I came across it. And I found that when I started working in legal in legal tech, I didn't even think of it as um, having an agile approach. But then I, th I thought like, oh, that thing that I did like five years ago comes in handy now. So it's pretty much that. Awesome. That's super interesting. Thank you for sharing. I have one more question really quick too around sort of um, everyday application. And um, if anyone else has a question, they can obviously um, join as well. But um, when I was thinking about what you were saying um, about the importance of the team as problem solvers and not relying on tech, it's only and solely on the tech itself. Um, you have to train your team. You also have to implement these sort of agile practices every day. For some startups that looks like sprints and scrums and you know this kind of um, all of the different ceremonies and company plannings and retrospectives and things like that. And so how important do you think it is in the legal industry to adopt these kinds of more sort of formalized um, agile sort of approaches and sort of daily practices like daily standups and things like that? Um, do you think that that has a place or do you feel like because of the sort of differences between um, what kinds of projects are working on? Do you feel like there's any difference or do you feel like those ceremonies and different things have a place in legal in the legal industry as well? I didn't definitely think they do. Um, when you're talking about the legal industry, you mean when we're talking about implementing legal tech or right. legal tech within the legal industry. So like you as a lawyer working on tech projects. I think they do, and I think that's the value that legal tech consultancy can bring. So usually you would have a client and you would have a software vendor. So you would have a software and there's actually no one to translate the tech to the customer. So the customer knows they, their business and their legal need, their needs better. But then the vendor, um, there's kind of no one, there's no intermediate to to translate between uh, those two parties. And I find that being a legal tech consultant, you're kind of the person who has to translate the tech into the business needs. And that's where there's uh, a place for being agile. So that's where it's valuable, I think, to be able to manage that project um, in an agile way, because uh, the the business is not gonna think about all of that, all of that, all that they're thinking about is having that project ready for them to use at the end of the day. So uh, the whole, um mix about managing that project properly they're not necessarily trained in doing that but yeah th i think there's a place for it super helpful thank you so much and um i think we'll go ahead and wrap up this question portion you can always ask questions to Anja afterwards we'll share her email at the end um so i'm just gonna share my screen really quickly and uh do our announcements so uh from Anja's side you can get in touch with Anja by going to lawneedstech.co. Um, like I said, I'll share her email towards the end. On the document side, um, we have a new CTO, Pierre Martin. So welcome to Pierre. And if you're going to be attending the KM Legal Conference today and tomorrow, look out for Molly and John. Molly's on here supporting us, even though she's at the conference. Thank you. Uh, on my side, I'd love to announce that we're doing the Documator Certification course. So you can now become a certified documenter. Um, Pre-sales launch on November 30th, and we're currently in closed beta, which starts next week. Some of whom are and our some of the cohort members are on the call right now, which is very exciting. Thanks for being here. Um, I am also the global ambassador to law schools. So if you have any connections to a law school, if you're a professor or no professor, um, and would like to have a document introduced to different law students. Uh, please do reach out to me at Brittany at document.org and I'd be happy to arrange uh, for them to get free student accounts as well as deliver a workshop where we build along together in real time and make legal apps. Some reminders on the document side as well. The marketplace is now live so you can um, get different free workflows. You can also have and uh, put your own workflows on the marketplace and earn money. Um, you can also add any feature, uh, feature requests to the wish list. And you can get document swag using the hashtag built on document hashtag on social media. And then Trisha Duffin, who's here on the call today, um, hosts office hours every Friday, which is really exciting. 
We host these lightning talks on the last Thursday of each month, except for next month where it will take place on the 17th of November due to Thanksgiving on the 24th. So next up, I'll be interviewing Paul Sutton, the co-founder of LCN Legal. It's an ultra niche boutique law firm based out of the UK, and we'll be discussing the topic getting started in document automation, an iterative value focused approach, which can get you tangible results in 14 days. You can register for that in future lightning talks on the Eventbrite page. That concludes the main portion of our lightning talk for today. We'll now be transitioning into an optional five minutes of speed networking. Feel free to go if you need to, but if you'd like to stay, we'll stop the recording now and move into the speed networking portion. For the, for the